here we are. Yay. Good morning. Good morning, Bo. How are you? I'm great. It's so great to have you here, and I'm so excited. I can't even tell you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm excited to share some knowledge. Yeah. Yes. And I, you know, I, that was really the, the reason to the impetus for this whole series on interviewing people that specialize in specific areas with the horses. Um, because my goal at, as Coherence Horsemanship Institute is really to, to uh, make a global difference in the, the care, the understanding and the interaction with horses. And I really want to create a, a hub of information with people that are knowledgeable that we can make it easy for people to find this information. I feel that it's really vital and because people don't ask why or how, how can I change something or why is this like this? Um, a lot of really am amazing, important information never gets learned. So that's why you're here. That's why well, I thank you. You know, and, and sometimes people are embarrassed to ask because they think they should know where they can go to a site like this and get some information. And so thank you for having me and, and sharing your your wealth of knowledge as well as, you know, other people's in their specialty fields. So absolutely. So I just want to say for everybody else's uh, understanding that uh, we're here this morning with Jackie Gladow, mm -hmm. who is a therapeutic massage therapist, has been for over 20 years uh, for horses and for people, which I wish I lived in your neighborhood. <laughs> I would come and see you regularly. <laughs> um, uh, and that you said that you had studied with uh, Doris K. Halstead yes. uh, for a length of time. I, I'm still in, I'm still working with her. Every time I get to see her, we work together. So awesome. that's, been, that's been over 20 years as well. And she's written several books on equine and human myofascial release. Uh, Symmetry in Motion is one and then Release the Potential. Um, and she also talks about her BREM method, B-R-E-M-M -M method on myofascial release so it's her own specific method methodology yeah. so okay. um very very amazing woman and um, i'm blessed to know her yeah well and to have gleaned knowledge and and be able to put that into action also i was really impressed yeah. i went to uh look at those titles and those books yeah. are 180 dollars a piece so oh yeah sure. well, a lot of them, information yeah I, well there, a lot of them are out of print so there's a limited amount of of books um to, to be had so yeah so how about would you jackie just kind of tell our viewers what it is that you do because you do more than one thing and both of those things are super important in the health and well-being of humans and horses right right well um i i do therapeutic massage work on both horses and people that's first and foremost and that's what i've been doing for over 20 years um, the importance of that is to create symmetry in our bodies and our horses' bodies so that we can perform or even just live at, at our best quality. Um, so it's, it's much like if you have a bicycle wheel and, and a, there's one spoke missing, there's a little wobble in the wheel. And it's much like our bodies that if they get restrictions in them, it limits that complete movement potential. So by releasing those restrictions, you allow the body a greater range of motion. And this pertains to whether it's a horse or a rider, it doesn't really matter, but allowing them to work through that, that restriction and engage that part of the body again, that's what's critical in, in healing of any nature. So that's what I, I look at um, on both horses and people. What am I looking at? Are they symmetrical? Is there a physical reason, or I should say bony structure reason, why they aren't symmetrical? And if not, it's soft tissue. So, you know, some people have one leg shorter than the other or longer than the other, and I can't change that. But I can give um, treatment so that they can deal with those asymmetries as well as strengthening weak sides of the body, things like that. So, so that's, that's the main thing. Um, I have been a saddle fitter for over eight years. Um, I worked for four different wolf lock saddle companies and um, eventually found another brand that I particularly liked because they paid attention to the biodynamic connection between the horse and rider. So one of the most important things that I felt was always critical in saddle fit was finding a tree that matches the bony structure shape of the horse. And so many companies out there just pull a generic tree and then they use the flocking 
to change the shape to fit the horse, which it does work, but that should be reflocked every three to four months. And most people don't do that. Oh my and goodness. So as that, as that uh, flocking flattens out, the tree becomes very evident to the horse. And so when you're riding and you feel like the horse isn't, isn't possible, it isn't possible for the horse to give you his back. Physically it isn't because when he lifts and that tree isn't the right shape, they, they, twist or move or you know to to get away from that pressure point you know they still want to give us so much they want to they want to really do the best work that they can for us but it's impossible if the equipment that you have does not fit them correctly so so i have ahead. a question yeah. um, <laughs> um three every three to four months yeah right oh my goodness That's a well, lot. how many people do you know that know that uh, not many, not unless they heard it from me. So, but that's what the wool flock companies that I worked for told me that that's, those were their, their words, because as the horse, you know, that wool is soft and pliable and it's made to settle and shape to the horse. Yes. But as that settles and compresses, you get closer and closer to the tree. And as that tree becomes more evident to the horse and it doesn't fit his bony structure, there are problems. And that's why you start to have these issues. If you, the, if, if every company went back to square one and had a different tree shape for every back shape or close to it, I mean, there some are, are similar, but that in my opinion is one of the most important things that I want to stress is you've got to have um, a, a, a solid tree m mirroring the back of the horse in shape because so, that's what's critical. Yeah. So can you help people understand? I mean, uh, you go to uh, most people go to a saddle store and they climb in a saddle and they say, "Wow, this feels really great." It's yeah. sitting on something that's not, you know, okay. okay it's a fiberglass form, maybe, right? Yeah. If you're lucky, or a barrel or a saddle yeah. stand. Exactly. And yeah. they go, "Wow, this this really fits." And then, yeah. but the connection between the shape of the back of the horse, right, and not just your rear end sitting in it, that's right. a huge factor. And then huge. Yeah, how do people deal with that? I mean, because obviously it's set in the industry that there are only so many trees that are out there. How right, do right. Deal with that, Jackie. Well, you know, unfortunately, they usually don't deal with it, and and our horses suffer. And that's what I want to. That's why I want to educate people about this. So, if you sit in that saddle in the shop, and it's uncomfortable for you, you have the choice to grab another saddle and put it on there horse doesn't have that choice okay so i want to educate people to allow them to understand how it interacts with the horse's back and what they can do about it to change that and to make it more comfortable or get rid of their saddle altogether and i'm the bearer of bad news when i say it doesn't fit and it's not going to fit yeah. you know you can tweak it it's still not going to fit the way it should fit okay so if you are carrying a backpack a rigid backpack and a bar is getting you in the back. How effective are you going to be? How much are you going to enjoy that hike? How much are you going? So it's so critical to get these horses as comfortable as possible. And I mean, I know people say, oh, well, when I was a kid, you know, I had a saddle that fit everything. I just put another saddle pad underneath it. And that's not the way. To, we know better. We know so better. Now. Can you, would you just uh, very succinctly, maybe three things that are, acceptable in in helping a saddle to fit better from what you're saying over a period yeah. of time that's going to change too but yeah. to begin with yeah yeah personally i like memory foam okay. the memory foam and the technology today of the memory foams is far surpa surpassed than what we ever had 20 years ago so it does you know one of the companies that i work for their memory foam had a lifespan of over 20 years so when you when you start talking about um it's going to collapse it's going to it's going to um the uv rays get to it and it kind of gets all hard or it gets soft and it like literally disappears and turns to dust that doesn't happen anymore and and i have experience in that field and you see these wonderful technologically advanced memory foams that can last for 20 or even 30 years so a couple of things is make always make sure that the tree is wide enough that's that's a big factor um, and when a horse is hollow behind the shoulders, that really needs, because if you don't make it wide enough to allow for muscle development there, they're never going to develop. Mm -hmm. 
And if the tree shape isn't right to begin with, they're not going to use their back and they won't develop. Well, so they can't. there's this yeah. conundrum that you get into and it's almost impossible to get out of unless your saddle fitter understands the, the importance of getting that tree shape to match the horse's back. Mm -hmm. So, you know, width is a critical. Um, I prefer memory foam. Some people want wool and that's fine. As long as that tree shape matches the horse's back. And what we look at is one of the biggest things that I look at is what, what I call a distance. Okay. And by distance, I mean, from directly behind the shoulder of the horse, if you palpate to the edge of the horse's shoulder and then draw a line, you know, with your finger, okay. And just put a straight up and down line like that. And then you go back to where the horse's withers come into the back, right where it joins right there. And I can move over here. Uh, there we go. Look at right there. <laughs> Not quite the right picture, but you get what I mean. So where the wither drops into the back, draw another line. So you have two parallel lines there. The distance between those two lines is what I call the distance. Okay. Does your horse have a long wither? Okay. Not usually that long, but it happens or a little short wither. And it can stick up. I'm not worried about that in that measurement. That's the distance. The next measurement that I'm worried about, you've got these two lines. One starts here, okay, behind the shoulder because it's, it's forward of the withers. And then you've got this one. So if you draw a line out from this tip to the one that I had right here, then all of a sudden you've got what, what I call the drop, okay? And that drop tells you how tall your horse's withers are. Okay, so if we have a horse with a taller wither, um, we are going to want to accommodate the rear part of the saddle to keep it in balance to add more flocking or memory foam to the back of that saddle to keep that saddle in balance. So, and then the compensation is what happens. My horse right here had a super flat back. It's really pretty evident right there. I mean, he was like a tabletop in a, in a barrel. He was round, he was round and flat if, at the same time. So flat to go back and very rounded on its sides and filled up by the spine. Um, so he was a difficult horse to fit. So those are the three things that I, you know, the compensation of what happens to that back after that second line. Is it swoopy? Is it a little bit curvy? Is it flat? Is it almost a little roached? All those things come into play when you're talking about the tree shape and the final fit of the panels as well. So question, Jackie, the, you're talking about a tree. Now I'm familiar with Western saddles and in some cases you're able to actually acquire a tree with nothing on it, which is yep. really truly the only way I think that you can, with a Western saddle, know the shape of that saddle versus the shape of the back of the horse because you have all that leather that's on top of that and all the, the flocking underneath it the sheepskin or whatever they put underneath that right um, how with an English saddle because you're specifically talking about English saddles do people know because it's not as common to be able to see an English saddle tree well, when you put a saddle on a, on a buck or, or even a, um, you know, the back of a chair or something, as long as it's reasonably balanced, you can actually see the balance point of that saddle. You know, if the, if the pommel's way too low, you know, you can almost visualize, I've seen people take a pen and put it in the seat and, and find that balance point of the saddle. So again, the saddle, when you set it on a buck, obviously it's not living, breathing, moving, it's flat, it's stationary, but you can get an idea of where the balance point is in that saddle, where your seat bones are going to sit. Okay. And personally, I fit people so that their the majority of their weight is at the base of the withers. Okay. Because that's where the horse naturally carries his center of balance. Mm -hmm. And it's easiest. All those connections of all those muscles are there. It's the strongest part of the horse's back. And it's also, like I said, their center of balance. But if you ride your horse bareback, that's where they put you. That's their natural center of balance. So that's a little bit more forward. I don't want to sit my, my saddle back over his kidneys. I don't want my weight back there. I don't want those large panels on the saddles that, that kind of come down and make a big, you know, almost like a banana curve underneath there. Those are a sure way that they're trying to spread out the weight over an area that, in my opinion, really shouldn't be carrying the majority of, of the weight of the rider. It should be closer up to the base of the withers. Okay. So, yeah. so and I know from uh, a tip sheet that you uh, had sent me that you talk about that balance point and how does somebody find that 
on each horse because it's going to be a little bit different based on where the withers and the length of the withers exactly are so go to the base of the withers that's the balance point okay. it's that simple it really is that simple yeah because you can get on any horse bareback and if you're riding around at a walk naturally they're going to put you right at the base of their withers yeah okay so yeah right. so um I'm just curious what set you on the track of doing this kind of work because it's not there's not that many of you guys out there I mean unfortunately for all of us fortunately for you because it's like oh my gosh she knows so much and so talented so much experience and we have to come to you yeah but what set you on this path well I didn't start out to be a saddle fitter in all honesty I, I started out as a massage therapist um, I had cracked two vertebrae in my neck. Oh, I had adopted a Mustang um, and we were trying to castrate him and we got enough anesthesia in there to knock down a baby elephant and he wasn't going down. As a matter of fact, he broke free of the cross ties and ran out to the pasture and he had ropes hanging off of him. So I, knowing him the best, reached down to untangle the ropes and he charged and he hit me right here, which knocked me out and, and cracked two vertebrae on the transverse process of the spinal cord. So thank God there was no dangerous spinal cord involvement, but I had all this massive scar tissue right here. And my rotational component in my neck was only about 30 degrees. That's all I could get. And I went to orthopedic surgeons and, and chiropractors and physical therapists and occupational therapists and neurosurgeons and you name it. I, I went to them and I, I gave up. I gave up. I was um, borderline addicted to pain meds because when it got real bad, that's the only way I could function. Um, and I met a woman that said, let me work on you. And I said, what do you mean, let me work on you? I've been everywhere. You know, when you're in pain, you're mad all the time. You're angry. You're, why did this happen to me? So long story short, she did myofascial release um, on me, released all of that in there. And, you know, I have, you know, better rotation wow. than the average person now. I mean, I'm like an owl because I keep up with it. But, you know, that that changed my life. And so I wanted to change other people's lives. And I'm such a horse lover that I wanted to also incorporate that into the horses. So that started my journey on massage therapy, uh, licensed and, and certified in human massage, and then, you know, progressed to, to the equine end of it too. And then meeting Doris just changed my life. And she helped me integrate the treatment of both horses with the people, or excuse me, both the people and the horses and that integration that flows and, you know, uh, I, the experience was amazing and, and still is. Every time I see her, I see, I learn something new. Oh, so very grateful and blessed to have that woman in my life. Yes. Uh, and I do know personally about myofascial works. It, yeah. Yes. It's, it's no surgery, <laughs> yeah. no purple tunnel yeah. surgery. I had a very similar neck yeah. thing and yeah. That's where it comes from. Yeah. Carpal tunnel, you know, it's everybody wants to pinpoint the wrist here because that's where it usually, that's where it tightens down, but it actually starts C1, C2. <laughs> Absolutely. So, but you know, eight years ago, I would straighten out a horse. I would straighten out the rider, put them together. And they're still sitting like this on there, you know, and I'm like, what? I'd look at their saddle and I'm like, how can even people ride in this? You know, they're, they're four inches behind where they should be. The horse is obviously uncomfortable. There's no top line. There's no muscle development. So that's when I started learning about saddle fitting and, and working for the various companies. But a lot of the companies don't want to recognize the importance of tree shape to the fit. They say, I can fit any horse because I can, um, manipulate the panels which create that and that's true they can if especially if they understand biodynamics and biomechanics and so if they don't what typically happens is you feel your saddle a wolf flock saddle is kicking you off to the right okay so you call the saddle fitter they come out oh yeah it's kicking you off to the right so what do they do typically typically not everybody, but typically they will pull the saddle off and take more wool stuffing and shove it under the right side and then get your level. So all of a sudden you're riding level again. This feels great. What does it's it feel like? The mm -hmm. Yeah. It increases the pressure on that series of muscles that they number one, haven't developed in the first place and actually increases the chances of them never building muscle there because they can't, they physically can't. They have this 
pressure that prevents that that muscle from building. See, so that so, totally that makes sense. Yeah, yeah but yeah. unless somebody explains it the way that you've explained it, mm -hmm. I don't think people understand what they're well, doing. Right, and and, a, and from a flocker's point of view, their focus isn't biomechanical involvement with the horse. No. It's making everything level and symmetrical. But in doing that, you have to consider the underside <laughs> and what it's being sat on, a living, breathing thing. So, and in doing that, that's when you start to understand um, how important this stuff is. You know, with the memory foams, they're a lot more forgiving. And that's what I loved about them more is because once you flock it, you flock it. It's done. And it will just compress, compress, compress. Whereas the memory foam adapts on a daily basis. Every time you put that on, it readapts. It so re you're talking about a pad that's memory foam? No, the, the panels of the saddle. Oh, the panels of the actual yes. saddle are memory yep. foam. So what company, because I've not seen that in very many oh, saddles, well. and I've yep. looked at a lot of bottoms of saddles, but... I know, yeah. There's there's several out there, and I really don't want to you know mention names, okay. but there are several out there that offer memory foam panels. And so if somebody does a yeah. Google search for memory foam saddles, that... Yep. Yep. Okay. That would be the best way to find it. Yep. Okay. So, and I, and I have my preference on, on different saddles, but I'd rather, you know, not say, okay. yeah. um, but, and, and that doesn't mean a wool flock saddle won't work. It will. It okay. absolutely will. Especially if they get the tree right, they're still going to have to have reflocking regularly. Okay. You know, I used to do it twice a year and I thought I was really good, but um, evidently it, it was supposed to be done more than that. Every so. four months. That is amazing. I, yeah, I've yeah. been in the horse world my whole life. Yeah. I've never heard that. Yeah. Yeah. Every three to four months, you know, so quarterly, you know, um, and, and it depends on your performance. If, if the horse's performance doesn't seem to be affected, there's probably a good match between the tree and the horse, but it's still going to compress. Okay. It's still going to compress. So yeah. I wanted to kind of bring this circle, the wagons back around again. Um, you are in what state? I'm in Florida. I'm in Florida. <laughs> kind of the opposite end of the universe for me. You're totally at the opposite end of the continent. Yes. Um, and I know that people would benefit greatly from your service. How yes. are you able to do that virtually? Or are you? Yes, I can. I can actually help and assist in virtual fittings. Um, yep. And we set up either on, you know, Zoom or we can set up on uh, FaceTime if you have a, an iPhone or whatever. And, and um, I've had great success with people um, taking their own measurements and understanding. We can put the saddle on the horse. I, you know, as long as you have the camera, I can see exactly what you're seeing. I can talk you through it and, and educate you as to why or why not it fits. Okay. So, um, there's so much that can be done virtually. It's, okay. it's pretty amazing. I will also travel, you know, um, of course you have travel expenses and the cost of, of what I'm doing. But if you take those travel expenses and split it out between, you know, six or eight people mm -hmm. that yeah. I can get down in two days, then, then it, it's a lot more affordable for most people, but I'm happy to travel. Uh, I'm happy to travel. So, okay. Yeah. I'm also in the process of setting up, um, a video, that you will be for purchase that you will be able to um i'll be able to walk you through on the on the videotape to to show you how to take your horse's tracings and and what to look for how to palpate the back you know where where can i see that this looks good as far as a fit so yes. and those were yeah. questions i was going to ask but yeah then I know. that's so much information yeah. and i think that the information that you've given this morning has been incredibly invaluable and just right. a, a different perspective, which is yeah. truly why I want to do what I'm doing is yeah. that there's so many perspectives that need to be considered. And what we usually do is we just trust uh, either our trainer, God bless yeah. us all, right? <laughs> I'm one of them. Exactly. Yeah. We can't know everything. How is, how is that even possible? And that's yeah. what people like you are so, so invaluable for is that well, you specialize yeah. in that. And, and, I, and I think that you know, most trainers want one saddle to work for all horses. Mm -hmm. Now, it's, it's, I'm sorry to tell you, it's not going to happen. Yeah. Now, we can make one saddle work for several horses if they're similar in their back shape. <laughs> so we can use different padding options. I do love, I'm a big fan of thin line saddle pads because they're, the thickness of the pad stays the exact thickness throughout the whole ride. So it's not changing constantly, gel or 
memory foam or things change because I want to know exactly what I'm putting between the horse and the saddle so I can get the right width on the saddle. If I put something under there, it's going to make it tighter. Yeah. Yeah. So, but one thing that I know that you deal a lot in, in Western saddles and you're more familiar with Western saddles as, as far as fit goes and whatnot. Um, one of the biggest things that I see out there that I don't think anybody's ever addressed, I've never seen it addressed, is you've got a girth that comes around the, the stomach of the horse and the diaphragm. I like to have as little amount as possible between the girth and the bottom of the saddle. Okay. I know that that sometimes that'll put a lot of buckle up under, but if you have longer billets, you can bring it down and, and have at least some padding underneath there because many horses get sore when you have, especially in the Western saddles, you've got a short cinch and it's down here and you've got this much, you know, this much room between that and the saddle ring and all they've got is that thin little strap and it puts a lot of pressure on those cinch rings and I just worked on a pony a couple of weeks ago that was he had like big scars you know scar tissue underneath his skin from where they've been using that same cinch over and over and over again so I like to have that girth come up as high as comfortable as possible or at least put something under there you know to give instead of it dissipates the pressure instead of putting more pressure in specific areas. So, well, and this is, it's funny that you even bring that up. And yes, I absolutely agree with what you're saying. Um, there is a whole center of nerves that sits right where that, where you're talking about. Exactly. Um, yeah. That I'm doing an in depth uh, study on right now that will also be on the website for okay. exactly that okay. very same reason is that people don't know that. I'm, no. I'm amazed at what we don't know. And yeah. I didn't know that until I started looking into why, why am I? Yeah. My crazy question. Why is yeah. that like that? Yeah. Oh, let's go find out. Oh my goodness. Yep. So, uh, and in addition to what you were saying, Jackie, the amount of nerves that are along the spine that affect the neurological transfer of information to the brain. Oh yep. my gosh. Not just are we dealing with, yeah muscles that can or can't be developed because of the way that that's putting pressure, you're also right. disconnecting that connection to the brain. And oh my, Absolutely. And you've yeah. taken the whole workings of the horse and said, no, yeah. we don't yeah. want you to do any of that. <laughs> right. And then we still ask them to do it. Yes. Yeah. Oh, oh my gosh. gosh. Yeah. 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 And, and some of so, those ways are not very nice when they don't. No, right? they're not. But they they're not. Well, you know, and most people take it almost like, well, this horse is just being, uh, being, uh, you know, uncooperative. They just, they, they're just always this way. Well, like you said, ask why, why are they doing this? They do not wake up in the morning and go, I am going to make my owner's <laughs> life a living hell during this lesson. No, they don't do that. They don't, they want, to, they want to help. They want to do the best that they can for you. You know, they want that good boy or good girl. They want yeah. that. They want to make it happy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. well thank you so much this has been so fun just chatting yeah. with you and listening to your story and and listening to all the information and i helping give a different perspective because there's always a different perspective that allows new information to be uh, found and yes and and this is this is my 20 years of experience do i know everything no but I want to find out everything. So that's the thing is I've got that inquiring minds want to know. And I want to find out, even if I go and we're having trouble with a fit, why is this not working? Why? I want to find out why. And that's what, that's what's fun. That's what's kept me in this for so long is finding the why to make that horse and rider's life a lot better quality. So. Thank you so much. And I want to uh, direct people to your website. Actually. Yes. Mm -hmm. You could give that. That would yes, be it's it's um. I don't know how soon this is going to be published, but it's under construction right now. But it will be gladyouride dot com. Oh. So G L A D U. That's my last name. Glad you ride dot com. So that is great. easy. Yeah. yeah. Thank so, and you. And I'm glad you ride. Yeah. I, w I want everybody to be happy they're riding <laughs> and enjoy their ride, and I want their horses to too. Yeah. Making ha healthy, happy horses. Yes. Yes. Absolutely. Thanks yep. for being I'll, a part I'll, of the, this uh, amazing journey, too. I really appreciate yeah. you. Thank you so much, Bo. Appreciate it. We'll talk again soon. Okay.